Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Just a little bit of a technical things at the second, but getting all sorted up. I'm trying some new things again today. Um, God bless you. Let's pray anyway. Lord, we thank you for this day that we can do a study again. Thank you, Lord, that uh, my health is in getting better and I'm getting stronger each day. I pray that you will continue with this work, Lord, that I will be continue to give the word out into the airways, over to the over down to the internet and whatever way is possible, Lord, that your word will be known in this day, in these difficult times. Lord, I want to pray for America at the moment, uh, seeing all those uh, militia on the streets and army soldiers on the streets and police and weapons and everything else. I pray for your peace for America, that your will will be done. And Lord, there will be peace, Lord, in this time. We pray for all the brothers and sisters in Christ there, Lord, who are fearful or worried, Lord, that they will put their trust in you, because you are in control of all circumstances and all peoples. Well, guys, I've had to reposition uh, the camera and things today because the cat's pinched my seat <laughs> where I normally do the video in. But as long as she's happy and quiet, I leave her at that. <laughs> leave her there. Well, today we're going to look at prophecy against Egypt and Ethiopia from Isaiah chapter 20. If you have your Bibles ready, you know, as I say, I read through the King James Version, but that's my preference. But uh, I would like to mention to you, you know, you, you read what you feel is necessary, you know, how we get the best out of it. Excuse me, as you can see, with these lockdowns, hairdressers, barber shops are shut, so I can't even get a haircut. <laughs> but anyway, that's nothing, is it really? It's only hair. Anyway, let's start. <laughs> Got to have a bit of banter sometimes, a bit of fun in life. And I'm beginning to look like, I don't know what I'm beginning to look like. It doesn't matter anyway, as long as we proclaim the word of God and preach his word, you know, that's what counts in this day and age. As long as we are faithful and put God first in everything. Let's begin at verse 1. In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him, and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And so he did. He did so. Excuse me, I've got to put a cushion in my back. Is that better? <coughs> Excuse me. Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. Sounds a bit uh, unusual, doesn't it? Let's see what happens next. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three, day, three years for a sign of wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and out of Egypt their glory. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whither we flee for help to deliver to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? That's a short chapter, so I'm going to continue reading into 21 as well. Prophecy against Babylon, the burden of the desert of the sea, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously. And the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media. All the say signings, sayings thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted fearlessly. 
panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward, ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horse and horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. All my threshing and the corn of my floor. That which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. Prophecy against Edom, the descendants of Esau, this says, the burden of Duma, he called to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Prophecy against Arabia. The burden upon Arabia, in the forest in Arabia shall he lodge, or ye travelling companions of Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Tima brought water to him that was thirsty, they prevented they prevented with their head bread him that fled and they fled from the swords from the drawn sword and from the bent sword and from the grievousness of war therefore thus hath the lord said unto me within a year according to the years of a hireling and all the glory of keda shall fail and the residue of the number of archers the mighty men of the children of keda shall be diminished for the lord god of israel has spoken it some very dramatic depictions there exactly what god says happens and god's word always comes to pass oh you know, and sometimes it's tough to hear it's tough to read it's tough to see what god is doing but god has always given men and women an opportunity to turn to him and repent it's the same in today's day and age we're going through some dark, difficult times as peoples, as nations, as God's people. But we must shine that light, the light of the gospel, the gospel, the message of Jesus, the good news that Jesus still loves and cares for us. And he's still pleading with men and women to come to him and repent. We may look around at the world today and we see similarities, similar things. Most of these things come because of men's pride and lack of serving God and turning their back on God and then they come to this mess this 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 oppressive time this time of darkness but God is calling his people to stand up and be counted to be watchmen on the wall to proclaim his message to do what he says we must do to live the lives he must say he says we must live to speak the words he wants us to speak and Lord and to shut our mouths when it's time to shut our mouths to know exactly, to know wisdom, to know justice, to know righteousness in our own hearts first. Then we can share that with the, with others. We can win men and women to Christ at these difficult times. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Repent and be saved at this time. We need to hear people that message pro proclaimed again. And I'm trying to proclaim this message on YouTube and other methods. Repent and turn to God at this time and see if I will not bless you. But if you do not turn and repent, God is saying to the nations of the world, I will pour out my judgments upon them. You see it in my, in my word. If you don't obey my word, this is what happened with the children of Israel and the other nations. The destruction will come. But God's patience only lasts for so long. He's very patient, God, yes, he's been loving. But then he's got to come a time where God has to act. And I believe God is beginning to act. He's beginning to sift the nations. He's beginning to uh, get 
the backslider, the person that knew God once, to turn back to him and to repent before the judgment falls. And there is going to be judgment. You look at the news, look at the media, see what's happening. Don't believe everything you say, though, because there is false broadcasting, there's false media out there. They only proclaim what they think is right, not what God wants. We must turn to God and listen to him. We must put God's voice first in everything. Let's continue. That's my little bit, but I want to read some of the notes that it says here in my Bible so we get a clearer, better understanding of what God is saying to Egypt and Ethiopia at that time. Let's begin in verse 1. Sargon the second was king of Assyria from 722 to 705 BC. And this event happened in 711 BC. Isaiah graphically reminds Judah that they should not count on foreign alliances to protect them. You know, we, can be, we have to trust in God. We cannot put our trust or confidence in princes, the Bible teaches, or in our governments, because they're human, they fail, they make the wrong decisions too. We must put our full confidence and trust in God. And God will honour his word. God has a plan. God is working through his plan at the moment in the nations of the world and what's going on in the world. But he's also calling his people, his watchmen. We are called as believers to be watchmen, to, to prepare, to watch what's happening. Jesus said to beware of what's going on, to watch for the signs, but also to trust in him. Uh, and would you know not to look to other men and women to help us to protect us no look to god you know because men will fail men can be swept around by every wind of doctrine it says or by every trend that's going on in the world you know even from the part of what clothes you wear and how you dress you know we can be swept along with things but we need to be swept along by god's holy spirit Verse 2, <coughs> chapter 20. God's command to Isaiah was to walk about naked for three years. Now, if we did that today, we'd be arrested and locked up, wouldn't we? You know, but he obeyed God. And are we willing to obey God? Are we willing to stand and be counted or do the thing, whatever God asks us to do? I mean, it was a humiliating experience for him. You know, Isaiah, but he had to obey God. God was using Isaiah to demonstrate the humiliation that Egypt and Ethiopia would experience at the hands of Assyria. Everything would be stripped away. You know, all the wealth of Egypt and all the prosperity that they had, God had already taken it away from them at one point through what happened with the children of Israel. But then they rebuilt and they, re, you know, and they, they got on with things, but God was taking it all away and he was humbling them. And God will humble us if our pride gets in the way and we think, oh, this is not going to happen, it's too soon, and this is not going to happen, and God will do that, and God will do this, and yet we put our pride and confidence in what we think is what God is saying. And instead of putting our full confidence in God, and God will sweep it away. Whatever we put our confidence and our trust in, God is just as, just as able to take that away from us. You know, our homes, our cars, our families. But our poor, all trust must be in God. And I believe there is a time coming we will have to make a decision. We either stand for God or we stand for other things. Our family, our friends, our nation. Or we stand for God. God is calling us to be stand up and be counted. You know, we must not put our trust or confidence in anything else but in Christ Jesus. You know, but this was an example. He saw them being humiliated. But the message here, in the note, says it was really for Judah. Don't put your trust in foreign governments. Or you will experience this kind of shame from your captors. Human governments and institutions can never take God's place. They have tried. They've tried to take God out of the schools. Tried to take God out of every decision. 
and just go according to what they want. But God is saying, no, no, no. Put your confidence in me. They can never take the place of God. And they're going to try and do that. Now, you know, it's coming a time where Christians will be counted and say, right, you either do this or you're gone or you're dead. You know, even your own families will turn against you. Even your own children will turn against you, the Bible says, in these last days. And they will report you to the authorities for doing things. Even by meeting together to worship. I believe that time will come where, you know, we will we'll have an attack on that. But we must encourage one another. We must preach the gospel. We must turn everything over our lives completely over to God. This year is a year of challenge for us as Christians and as believers. Are we going to put our full confidence in God this year? Or are we going to put it in our government or in our nation or in other things? Or are we going to put our full confidence in God? Because if we put our full confidence in God, we're assured of his blessings this year. We're assured that he will pour out of his spirit upon us. But if we continue to go along with the crowd, procrastinate, you know, and put off till tomorrow what we should be doing today in serving him, seeking him, spending time in the word, prayer, you know, God will turn and he will sweep us aside. And he can say to us, I never knew you. Some will say, I prophesied in your name. I healed the sick in your name. I did this in your name. And God said, well, you didn't put me first. You left me out. You listened to what other voices were telling you. But you didn't listen to what I've been trying to tell you all this time. The sound of that boom. But for those who really, truly turn to God in repentance this year and turn to him in seeking him, I believe revival will come. The revival we've been asking God for for many years will come when we turn aside from our wicked ways and stop putting our confidence in other things and putting idols up in our lives that come before the place of God, strip it all back, every bit of it, now, they tried to do that in the time of the children of Israel. Some of the kings, some good kings, some bad kings. Some continued to worship idols. Others tried to destroy them. But even when those who were even trying to do what God wants and put in everything and confidence in God, rejoicing in him in the difficult times as well, they were the ones who knew the blessing. Like when there was armies going out to fight. If they turned to God before and they put God first, they won the battles. But if we don't do that, we're going to lose the battles. We must put God first in everything. And God shows all this as examples to us of what can happen if we are faithful. And what will happen if we are unfaithful. Excuse me. Don't put your trust in foreign governments. Or you will experience this kind of shame from your captors. Human governments and institutions can never take God's place. God asked Isaiah to do something that seems shameful and illogical. At times we may be asked to obey God in ways we don't understand. We must obey God in complete faith. For he will never ask us to do something wrong. You know that? according to his law and his what is right and what's wrong you know not what men and women say is right and wrong but what god says the ten commandments are still important for today the important love the lord your god with all your heart soul and strength and then jesus says love your neighbor of yourself but if you don't put god first nothing else is going to be successful i know you can hear that that's the rubbish uh you know Big man come in taking our rubbish away if you can hear that noise outside. Right, let's look at this again. Chapter 21, verse 1, in the notes I have here says, Some scholars say this prophecy was fulfilled at Babylon's fall in 539 BC. See Daniel chapter 5. But others say this was a prophecy of Babylon's revolt against Assyria in 700 BC. 
If the prophecy refers to the verse five, if prophecy refers to the Babylon of five thirty nine, this may refer to the feast in Daniel chapter five. Okay, the six and seven an important point that we need to consider today. Watchmen, verse 6 and 7 of chapter 21, watchmen often appear in prophetic visions of destruction. They are the first to see trouble coming. The prophet Habakkuk was called a watchman, Habakkuk 2 verse 1. The vision of the chariots and warriors could represent the Medes and Persians attacking Babylon in 539 BC. Are you a watchman? We are. I believe we are called to be watchmen in these last days. This was a remnant of those who will stay faithful to Jesus Christ through great tribulation, through trial, who, who will stand up and be counted. We need to be watchmen. We need to look to see what's going on out there, but not be afraid of it, knowing that God is in control and God's hand is at work. And God will bring justice and judgment to the nations of the world. He often uses bad kings, bad leaders, bad things to bring about the destruction of another nation. He uses so many different ways. God's ways are not our ways. They pass the understanding. We don't understand why God moves and does things in a particular way. But we will always see, we can always see that God has a plan. And purpose in every circumstances to draw us nearer to him and to bring his judgment. Babylon was not only a great and powerful city, it was also filled with horrible sins. So are the nations of the world today. So is our nation. Idolatry, yeah, witchcraft. There is a great sense of people looking for supernatural power today in the world. You know, they try and they dabble in with tarot cards. There's a big thing about tarot cards in, even in Abraham, in the area where we work, where people are looking for supernatural power and miracles and things to happen. There's been a resurgence of people talk, going and talking to their dead relatives. I think maybe COVID-19 has something to do with it, where, where, where somebody has died or been sick. They not their families are not allowed to visit them, so they want to speak to them, and they are calling up mediums and other things to contact the dead person. But what does it say in the Bible? God warns about that. He says it's an abomination to him, and he, you know, those people, the mediums in the Bible, were stoned, destroyed. God wanted the uh, Christian believers to have nothing to do with them, nothing to do with mediums and witchcraft but only to do with Jesus Christ but young people today are fascinated with the supernatural think of it this way God is the God of the supernatural he's given gifts to men in the church the gifts of the Holy Spirit power, power gifts healing gifts prophetic gifts and if God's people are not using the word of God and speaking the word of God and be and standing up and be counted and laying hands on the sick and not being afraid of catching any disease but doing what God has told them to do and then you know the church, the world will see that there's power in the church but the church has been afraid of these things for so many years they're afraid to pray for people lay hands on the sick they have their prayer meetings but there's no power in them because god says if you lay hands on the sick they shall recover if you cast out demons in my name they shall be they will come out if you you know we can perform miracles in jesus name i believe if we as the church of god make our stand this year and become holy become humble before god God will use us to perform these miracles in the world today and the poor world will see there is power in the church. Because uh, the church of Jesus Christ I'm talking about here, those who are truly committed to him, that have given up their lives, are willing to give up their lives to serve him and not become part of the crowd. To become, as I spoke in another message last year, to not become, to come out and not be a goat but to be a sheep. Follower of Jesus Christ.
I go on a run sometimes, but I, I, you know, sometimes, but I really believe that if we take up the, the gifts God has given us and allow God to use us in those gifts, those power gifts will be seen. We will see miraculous healings, miraculous things happening that we know that could never have happened by chance. It can only happen because God has done it. God can even raise from the dead today. And I believe there's a time where we're going to see people being raised from the dead. Not just spiritually dead, coming to know Jesus Christ in salvation, but physically dead can be raised. Jesus showed us. He told us these signs shall follow them that believe. If you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, why aren't you doing these things? Why aren't you crying out to God to see these things happening? You know? Yeah. I've really been convicted over these things. You know, I haven't been doing what I should be doing. And God is saying, now is the time. Now is the time for my end time army to rise up and to possess the land, to take the nation and take our communities back for God, to get rid of the spirit of socialism that's crept in and the 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 the, the, the principality over our area of socialism and I think it's trying to creep in around the world too. We must break it down in Jesus' name and take our authority and cast out Satan and all his dominions before our communities can thrive again, before our communities can come under the blessing of God again. We as the churches, we as people of God have to make our stand and take up our spiritual weapons and fight against Satan and all his demons and the things that he's trying to do in our communities. Yeah, you look back at the history of revivals and you will see when people took, made their, Christians made their stand and got on their faces, not just on their knees, got on their faces before God and cried out to God, then God would change the spiritual atmosphere over our towns, our cities, our nations. But it's only when God's people truly repent and turn to him on behalf of the people and they walk holy lives before God. We've got to get rid of the idolatry, the witchcraft and temple prostitution, you know, and all the things that were going on then are going on today. Babylon was and remains a symbol of all that stands against God. Despite all its glory and power, Babylon would be destroyed with all its idols, and we know that happened. They would give no help in time of trouble. Threshing and winnowing, verse 10, were two steps in ancient Israel's farming process. The head of wheat, often used to symbolise Israel, were first trampled to break up open the seeds and expose the valuable grain inside. The seeds were then thrown into the air and the worthless chaff, the bits we don't, you don't want to keep, were blown away. While the grain piled back to the ground, Israel would experience the same kind of process. The worthless, sinful, rebellious people would be taken away. But God would keep the good grain to replenish Israel. There's a real message in that, isn't there? We have to be broken first, trampled, crushed and then the fork used to go in like a, uh, a fork and it would lift up the stalks and the chaff and everything and throw it up into the air the heavy seeds would fall to the ground and the rubbish would be blown away by the wind they used to have special um, places to do this sunken into the ground you know so that they would be keep the chaff and the seeds separate but we need to be go through a crushing, um, a breaking, a bruising experience. So the seed that God has put in us, the gifts that God has put in us, will be manifest. They will come out. So we need to allow God sifting his winnowing, to separating of us from the chaff, from the world. We need to be different. We need to be counted as God's people, and to obey him completely. We need to put our full trust in him. Let's continue with this again. You know, let's, God wants to use the best, keep the best, the best 
of the grain, not the stuff that's rubbish like the stalks and the old dead leaves. He wants to blow all that away. He wants to blow the crust, the the top surface off, so that he can reveal what's underneath in our lives and that's how God does it. God takes away the top surface so the good stuff is inside that he wants to bring out of you and of me so that he can use us in the gifts he's called us to. Duma of Edom had been a constant enemy of God's people. They rejoiced when Israel fell to the Assyrians and this sealed Edom's doom. We looked at this a lot in some of the other prophets a similar message came. Edom, whose father of original, found it was Esau, Jacob's brother. Obadiah foretells in great detail the destruction of Edom. He would like to study that. You can do that. We, we, I think we've covered it. We will probably cover it again. Because my ministry is to continue to look at prophetic ministry and to study the lives of the prophets, their message and ministry. 21 verse 13. The places listed here are all in Arabia. They are border cities that control the trade routes through the land. Nabonidus, king of Babylon, would attack Arabia and make the people his servants. He set up a court in Tima, leaving Belshazzar in Babylon as regent. Belshazzar? Yep. This is Isaiah's prediction of a disaster. Judah kept trying to make alliances with this Arabia against Nabonidus, but Isaiah warned the people against such an alliance and urged them to trust in God alone. Yeah, quite a lot in that message today. A lot to think about, a lot to ask God to search us, to win us, to try us. And to use us to be watchmen on the tower, you know, watching out and seeing what's coming and being prepared and crying out, alarm, 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 you know, you know, you know, because we are the ones that God's going to use in this latter day harvest that's coming, this latter day, this revival that he's promised us. He said he would restore the years the locust have eaten, the palmer worm, very famous passages from the book of Joel and I've heard it quite a bit lately and I believe God is doing that. He's allowing all the dross, all the filth, all the rubbish to be taken away in the church so that the, that the church will come through as his beautiful bride, practicing, giving, doing exactly the things that he commands us to do in Mark 16 and other chapters to to do the things God's called us to do, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptised with the Holy Spirit, and to be moving in the gifts of the Spirit. The modern-day watchmen should be filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaiming the Word of God. Now I ask you to pray to God that will stir you, that he will touch your lives, he will show you if there's anything in your lives that is not completely turned over to him. So God wants you to stand up and be counted. Be holy as I am holy. A lot in the message today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that you've given me new strength to be able to do these things. I pray, Lord, for the hearers, Lord, that we would all, even myself, would not be just a hearer of your word, but doer of the word, living your word, Lord, seeking to be holy as you are holy, looking to you, Lord, for every decision in our lives, not putting our trust in governments, peoples, nations, but putting our full trust in you. Lord, I ask you to bless those who hear now, in the name of Jesus. And I pray that this message will go out throughout the world, that men and women will know you, Christians will turn back to you, backsliders will come back to you. But Lord, we will put our trust and our hope in you. We will put no confidence in man or princess. Lord, but we will put our full trust in you. Amen. Well, thank you guys for listening in to this broadcast today. I pray the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. I pray for his shalom, peace on you.
If you've enjoyed this message today, please like and share it so that many more people will come to know Jesus Christ and understand what he's doing in the world today. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.